This evening's participants then are professionally trained, well-published scholars. They know that either God exists or else God does not exist. They disagree about where the truth of that matter lies. Our debate format is simple. There are four rounds of descending length, two 20-minute opening statements, two 12-minute comments on the opening statements, two eight-minute responses to the previous remarks, and two five-minute closing statements. After a very brief break, we will begin a half-hour session of questions and answers. There's no need for me to make any further introductions, and Professor Craig and Flew will proceed through the four phases of their remarks without any interruption. Then I will formally close the debate and shortly thereafter open the question and answer session. It is then my genuine pleasure to introduce Professor William Craig and Professor Anthony Flew. As is traditional, the affirmative side starts. Let the debate begin. Good evening. I want to begin by expressing my thanks for the privilege of participating in this event on the 50th anniversary of the famous Copleston Russell debate. And it's a special honor to be sharing the platform tonight with Professor Flew. Now, in order to determine rationally whether or not God exists, we need to conduct our inquiry according to the basic rules of logic and ask ourselves two fundamental questions. Number one, are there good reasons to think that God exists? And number two, are there good reasons to think that he does not? Now with respect to that second question, I'll leave it up to Dr. Flew to present the reasons why he thinks that God does not exist. But notice that although atheist philosophers have tried for centuries to disprove the existence of God, no one's ever been able to come up with a successful argument. So rather than attack straw men at this point, I'll just wait to hear Dr. Flew's answer to the following question. What good arguments are there to show that God does not exist? Let's look then at the first question. Are there good reasons to think that God exists? Tonight, I'm going to present five reasons why I think theism is more plausibly true than atheism. Whole books have been written on each of these, so I can only present here a brief sketch of each argument and then go into more detail as Dr. Flew responds to them. These reasons are independent of one another, and taken together, they constitute a powerful cumulative case for the existence of God. Number one, then, the origin of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Why anything at all exists instead of just nothing? Typically, atheists have said that the universe is just eternal and uncaused. As Russell remarked to Copleston, the universe is just there, and that's all. But is that really all? If the universe never began to exist, then that means that the number of events in the past history of the universe is infinite. But mathematicians recognize that the existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to self-contradictions. For example, what is infinity minus infinity? Well, mathematically, you get self-contradictory answers. This shows that infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. David Hilbert, perhaps the greatest mathematician of this century, states, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. But that entails that since past events are not just ideas, but are real, the number of past events must be finite. Therefore, the series of past events can't go back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. This conclusion 
has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. The astrophysical evidence indicates that the universe began to exist in a great explosion called the Big Bang 15 billion years ago. Physical space and time were created in that event, as well as all the matter and energy in the universe. Therefore, as the Cambridge astronomer Fred Hoyle points out, the Big Bang theory requires the creation of the universe from nothing. This is because as you go back in time, you reach a point at which, in Hoyle's words, the universe was shrunk down to nothing at all. Thus, what the Big Bang model requires is that the universe began to exist and was created out of nothing. Now, this tends to be very awkward for the atheist. For as Anthony Kenny of Oxford University urges, a proponent of the Big Bang theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But surely that doesn't make sense. Out of nothing, nothing comes. So why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? Where did it come from? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. We can summarize our argument thus far as follows. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Now from the very nature of the case as the cause of space and time, this cause must be an uncaused, timeless, changeless, and immaterial being of unimaginable power which created the universe. Moreover, I would argue it must also be personal. For how else could a timeless cause give rise to a temporal effect like the universe? If the cause were an impersonal set of necessary and sufficient conditions, then the cause could never exist without the effect. If the cause were timelessly present, then the effect would be timelessly present as well. The only way for the cause to be timeless and for the effect to begin to exist in time is for the cause to be a personal agent who freely chooses to create an effect in time without any prior determining conditions. Thus, we are brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Isn't it incredible that the Big Bang Theory thus confirms what the Christian theist has always believed, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I simply put it to you, which do you think makes more sense? That the theist is right, or that the universe just popped into being uncaused out of nothing? I at least don't have any trouble assessing these alternatives. Number two, the complex order in the universe. During the last 30 years, scientists have discovered that the existence of intelligent life depends upon a delicate and complex balance of initial conditions simply given in the Big Bang itself. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are vastly more probable than any life-permitting universe like ours. How much more probable? Well, the answer is that the chances that the universe should be life-permitting are so infinitesimal as to be incomprehensible and incalculable. For example, Stephen Hawking has estimated that if the rate of the universe's expansion one second after the Big Bang had been smaller by even one part in a hundred thousand million million, the universe would have recollapsed into a hot fireball. PCW Davies has calculated that the odds against the initial conditions being suitable for later star formation, without which planets could not exist, is one followed by a thousand billion billion zeros, at least. Frank Tipler and uh, John Barrow estimate that a change in the strength of gravity or of the weak force by only one part in 10 to the 100th power would have prevented a life-permitting universe. 
there are around 50 such quantities and constants present in the Big Bang which must be fine-tuned in this way if the universe is to permit life. And it's not just each quantity which must be finely tuned. Their ratios to one another must also be exquisitely fine-tuned. So improbability is multiplied by improbability by improbability until our minds are reeling in incomprehensible numbers. There is no physical reason why these constants and quantities possess the values they do. The one-time agnostic physicist Paul Davies comments, through my scientific work, I have come to believe more and more strongly that the physical universe is put together with an ingenuity so astonishing that I cannot accept it merely as a brute fact. Similarly, Fred Hoyle remarks, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics. Robert Jastrow, the head of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, calls this the most powerful evidence for the existence of God ever to come out of science. So once again, the view that Christian theists have always held, that there is a designer of the cosmos, seems to make much more sense than the atheistic view that the universe, when it popped into being, uncaused out of nothing, just happened to be, by chance, fine-tuned to an incomprehensible precision for the existence of intelligent life. We can summarize our reasoning as follows. Premise one, the fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the universe is due to either law, chance, or design. Two, it is not due to either law or chance. Three, therefore, it is due to design. Number three, objective moral values in the world. If God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. Many theists and atheists alike concur on this point. For example, Russell observed, ethics arises from the pressures of the community on the individual. Man does not always instinctively feel the desires which are useful to his herd. The herd being anxious that the individual should act in its interests, has invented various devices for causing the individual's interest to be in harmony with that of the herd. One of these is morality. Michael Roos, a philosopher of science at the University of Guelph, agrees. He explains, morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. Friedrich Nietzsche, the great atheist of the last century who proclaimed the death of God, understood that the death of God meant the destruction of all meaning and value in life. I think that Friedrich Nietzsche was right. But we've got to be very careful here. The question here is not, must we believe in God in order to live moral lives? I'm not claiming that we must. Nor is the question, can we recognize objective moral values without believing in God? I think that we can. Rather, the question is, if God does not exist, do objective moral values exist? Like Russell and Roos, I don't see any reason to think that in the absence of God, the herd morality evolved by Homo sapiens is objective. After all, if there is no God, then what's so special about human beings? They're just accidental byproducts of nature, which have evolved relatively recently on an infinitesimal speck of dust, lost somewhere in a hostile and mindless universe, and which are doomed to perish individually and collectively in a relatively short time. On the atheistic view, some action, say rape, may not be socially advantageous, 
and so in the course of human development has become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is really wrong. On the atheistic view, there's nothing really wrong with your raping someone. Thus, without God, there is no absolute right and wrong which imposes itself on our conscience. But the problem is that objective values do exist, and deep down I think we all know it. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. Actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just uh, socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. Some things are really wrong. Similarly, love, equality, and self-sacrifice are really good. Thus, we can summarize this third consideration as follows. Premise one, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Two, objective values do exist. Three, therefore, God exists. Number four, the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was a remarkable individual. New Testament critics have reached something of a consensus that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracles and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands, and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, most people would probably think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just either believe in by faith or not. But there are actually three established facts recognized by the majority of New Testament historians today, which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, on the Sunday following his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian scholar who has specialized in the study of the resurrection, quote, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb, end quote. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent German New Testament critic, Gaut Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies. Fact number three. The original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, despite their having every predisposition to the contrary. Jews had no belief in a dying, much less a rising Messiah, and Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead before the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus so strongly that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. Luke Johnson, a New Testament scholar from Emory University, muses, some sort of powerful transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. N.T. Wright, an eminent British uh, scholar, concludes, that is why, as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, like uh, the disciples stole the body or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these three facts. And therefore, it seems to me, 
the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. Finally, number five, the immediate experience of God. This isn't really an argument for God's existence. Rather, it's the claim that you can know that God exists wholly apart from arguments simply by immediately experiencing him. This was the way that people in the Bible knew God. As Professor John Hick explains, God was known to them as a dynamic will, interacting with their own wills, a sheer given reality, as inescapably to be reckoned with as destructive storm and life-giving sunshine. To them, God was not an idea adopted by the mind, but an experiential reality which gave significance to their lives. Now, if this is the case, then there's a danger that proofs for God could actually distract your attention from God himself. If you're sincerely seeking God, then God will make his existence evident to you. The Bible promises, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We mustn't so concentrate on the external proofs that we fail to hear the voice of God speaking to our own hearts. For those who listen, God becomes an immediate reality in their lives. In conclusion, then, we've yet to see any arguments to show that God does not exist, and we have seen five reasons to think that God does exist. Together, these constitute a powerful cumulative case for the existence of God, and therefore I think that theism is the more plausible worldview. Um, well, I uh, thought I was going to have to begin as Socrates ended with an apology, because I thought I was going to ex have to explain that I wasn't going to uh, try to show that there is no God. I was going to try to show that there are no sufficient reasons for believing that there is. And uh, Dr. Craig apparently was wanting to maintain the exact opposite, uh, that I wouldn't be able to establish that there is no God, uh, but he thinks he's provided sufficient reasons for thinking that there is. Now, he has offered so many arguments that it will be impossible for me in any reasonable amount of time to answer them all. But uh, what I'm going to say, if it's right, will provide a sufficient reason for thinking uh, that he and others are altogether too bold in thinking uh, that uh, they know what caused the universe or they could know what caused the universe. My fundamental point is that we are all of us uh, creatures whose entire knowledge and experience have been of the universe. It is, after all, the only one there is and certainly the only one we have experience of. So, um, why should anyone think that they are able to um, provide an answer to the question? I take this business about um, uh, whether um, uh, God caused the Big Bang or whether you, the universe just popped into existence like that. Well, why are we offered only two possibilities here? Um, uh, why does anyone think uh, that these are the only two possibilities of an answer? Um, I think there are two things one needs to say about this. Um, and uh, one concerns um, the ultimates of explanation. So let me try to make this point. Every explanation of um, why anything is the case is given an answer in terms of something else, some very general or more general law, which at that stage is taken as a brute fact, the fact that explains other things. Now, this is surely of the nature of the case. You cannot have an end to all explanation that is anything other 
uh, than a brute fact, of course. Uh, some people find some sorts of brute fact satisfactory to them, and they think that's a good place to stop. Uh, but um, it doesn't mean that you're able to say it's absolutely wrong to stop at that point. So it seems to me uh, that you can't rule out uh, the possibility that our knowledge of the universe or our knowledge must stop with the Big Bang. That this itself is the ultimate fact. That if there's any first cause, it's somewhere at the beginning, you know, some microsecond away from the beginning. Because, after all, everything else in the universe is being explained now of course, the whole of cosmology may be different next year, but we're debating in <laughs> um, uh, Wisconsin tonight. Um, so uh, one has at least to entertain the possibility that it's not ridiculous popping in out of existence out of nothing. You know, if someone was there beforehand watching it, they'd say, gosh, it started out of nothing. Uh, uh, but, you know, we they're just not in a position to answer the question. And the fact that one is unable to suggest a, a cause for the Big Bang, why should you think uh, that anyone but a physicist is going to explain that? And if physics stops there, isn't that the end of human knowledge? Well, now let's consider uh, the alternative. Uh, and perhaps it would be a good idea to begin with um, Make him speak. Sorry, um, I'm uh, confronted with an affliction which I've never been confronted with before. I keep getting a dry mouth. I'm sorry, I'm under considerable handicaps tonight. Um, uh, yes, um, well, uh, let us actually produce a definition of God, the supposed explanation of everything. Right, uh, uh, this is the definition offered uh, by Richard Swinburne, which is generally accepted as the standard definition within the English-speaking countries. A person without a body, i.e. a spirit, present everywhere, the creator and sustainer of the universe, able to do everything, i.e. omnipotent, knowing all things, perfectly good, a source of moral obligation, immutable, eternal, a necessary being, holy and worthy of worship. Well, um, that's a lot of characteristics for this cause that uh, some of the audience clearly think, got it, that's what it must have caused the whole universe. Well. It's a lot of things. It would be perfectly possible uh, that there should be a, a being that uh, was omnipotent, omniscient, uh, but wasn't particularly interested in human conduct. Um, of course, of course, everyone thinking of creation um, uh, is thinking of the first uh, um, uh, two chapters of Genesis. Well, the creator, God there, created the whole universe in order to have some human beings in, created in his image. But why should we assume in this definition of God uh, that um, he has this interest in human behavior, uh, in morality and so on? And um, after all, if he was omnipotent and omniscient, and wanted people to behave in a certain way. If we don't know anything else about him, after all, I don't think we know anything about him, but if we, you know, wouldn't you expect, if you were omnipotent, you'd expect results and expect people to do what? And shouldn't our presumption being looking at human behavior and wondering uh, what omnipotence thinks about it, if we believed in omnipotence, what, as far as omnipotence is concerned, he's not interested in human behavior. Uh, this is, okay, I mean, why should one assume? Anyway, these are um, different things. 
people don't reckon. But you might well have an argument that might show there was an existing a being with some of these characteristics without the others. The second thing I want to say is that these characteristics are at least compatible. Uh, but the God that I understand um, Dr. Craig believes in um, is one who is described as good and benevolent and so on, but also but is described as a being who is um, expecting that the majority of the creatures he has created he is going to torture forever. Well, if you think these characteristics are compatible with benevolence, if your absolute values think that torturing anyone at all, apart from forever, is okay, well, this is not my idea. Of, I regard it as morally compulsive not to torture anyone at all. I regard this concept I'm not saying uh, this is a reason for not believing that uh, the torturer runs the universe. I am saying that these two characteristics aren't, uh, uh, are incompatible. I think, actually, uh, Dr. Craig, at some time, uh, is a little anxious about these things. I have somewhere, yes. Um, um, he says, if we take scripture seriously, we must admit that the vast majority of persons in the world are condemned and will be forever lost, even if in some relatively rare cases a person might be saved through his response to the light that he has, has apart from some special revelation. He then goes on to indicate, no orthodox Christian likes the doctrine of hell or delights in anyone's condemnation. I truly wish that universalism were true, but it isn't. Well, I regard that as a sign of grace uh, that he decided. But I still have to say that these two things are simply incompatible. It's a nightmare. And the idea that such a punishment could be just, don't you know what justice is? Would it, any, would it be regarded? Of course, if you like, the right ones are getting the punishment. But uh, justice isn't a matter of simply getting the right uh, ones punished for the crime. Uh, look, the punishment needs to be to some extent proportionate to the seriousness of the crime. And how could there be any offense committed by a human being in a short life that deserved a literally infinite um, punishment? So, what I'm basically trying to show is that there aren't good reasons for believing it. And my fundamental contention is that one shouldn't expect to be able to know things um, outside the universe and so on. Um, and if you like, the burden of proof lies on the person who says this. So uh, a new number of unanswered arguments from Dr. Craig um, will be sufficient to leave what I've said on one side, well that's no use, I've produced all these arguments he hasn't answered, because uh, no one could answer in the available time all the great long list of arguments he's produced, but uh, this I, well, shouldn't be answered and I think couldn't be answered is uh, uh, the argument, if you like, against the presumption of thinking uh, that we're in a position to say uh, what was going on, if anything was going on, outside the universe. But um, uh, let's uh, uh, look at what I believe is called the Kalam argument, which is a great favorite with uh, Doctor. The, I, the universe must have had a beginning uh, because um, uh, nothing could exist uh, uh, without beginning and without end. Uh, fair enough, I think uh, this is a good argument. But um, uh, this is supposed to be an argument uh, for creation by a, a bodiless person 
The notion I find very difficult to understand anyway. All the people I know are creatures of flesh and blood. Uh, but still, um, that it was created by a bodiless person who apparently um, uh, was himself uncreated and eternal. Now, it seems to me uh, that I don't doubt the universe had a beginning because uh, this is the um, uh, present view of physical science. And it looks as if uh, at least this part of the Big Bang theory is uh, likely to be with us permanently, but there may be some uh, uh, further things added. But uh, uh, surely, um, uh, if um, uh, 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 time uh, had to have a beginning, um, how do we explain that beginning by saying, oh, well, um, uh, uh, the beginning was started off, the whole universe was created by a being, uh, uh, well, um, uh, uh, that being um, really, yes, uh, existed eternally. Well, if this argument about uh, uh, time uh, couldn't have uh, 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 couldn't have, uh, if time couldn't have had a beginning, uh, then uh, how is it that, uh, as it were, there's a funny sort of time of which, uh, of course, none of us have ever had an experience, um, which, uh, well, uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, this did never had a beginning and it will never have an end. You know, simply won't do. Uh, the argument that gets us to the creation um, is inconsistent with the desired explanation of it. So I think, again, we come back to a decent um, ignorance. Um, I'm often thought to be a rather arrogant chap. How wrong people can be. Um, uh, but uh, I've uh, uh, never believed that I could give you a sort of guidebook outside the universe. Uh, I'd be a bit hard pressed to give you a guidebook to a fairly small area, but you know, this idea that, uh, 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 well, uh, you know, we can spare a group of rational chaps uh, and uh, uh, let's uh, expect that uh, they can all uh, recognize an argument showing that um, uh, this is how the universe began and uh, we know something about uh, uh, what must exist behind the universe. I don't think it will work at all, uh, this thing. Then, um, uh, uh, what about this, um, uh, my contention that um, a, an omnipotent being uh, could perfectly well, um, if he wanted people to behave in a certain way, if uh, this was the only thing that would content him, that they uh, became uh, his uh, devoted, devoted and obedient children. Well, why didn't he make them that way? You know, ordinary human parents would love their children to be obedient and virtuous and so on. Wouldn't we all who've been parents? Um, and we're all, I suspect, and you may have been done better than us, but uh, we've been rather unsuccessful. They're terribly good people, but uh, uh, they're far from obedient and far from the same. See what I mean? Well, now, uh, uh, but granted the resources of omnipotence, uh, I think I could manage uh, this. Um, but uh, apparently, um, the uh, God whom Dr. Craig is asking us to believe as the creator, um, very much wants people to believe in a certain way. And he wants this so much that he's prepared to torture them forever for punishment for not obeying me. Well, it seems to me that anyone who um, knew that that was what this cosmic Saddam Hussein wanted would behave like the sensible subjects of Saddam Hussein. They'll say anything about his merits and goodness. Oh, yes. Well, wouldn't you if you were going to fall into the hands of his torturers? But omnipotence could avoid all this by simply uh, making them creatures such that they would choose to obey him. How nice. Um, well, uh, uh, this is an 
argument, which I think may give uh, Dr. Craig a little pause. Um, yes, what can we do uh, briefly? Yes, about design. Um, everyone has heard of the argument to design, about how if we found a watch uh, in the bush, uh, we'd infer that uh, this was a product of design and so on. But surely the reason why uh, we infer that something was made by an intelligent being is not the complexity, it's simply uh, that it is an artifact, uh, obviously an artifact and not a natural phenomenon. The most complicated, sophisticated entities in the whole universe are entities of a sort of which I see about 3,000 around here. And they were not, at least within the universe itself, designed. They were, at least within the universe itself, we were, products of unconscious physical and mechanical forces. Um, uh, uh, this argument for design within the universe, the argument from design outside the universe is another one. And I won't try in the remaining 30 seconds to deal with that one now. Another time, another argument. You'll remember in my first speech, I argued that there are no good reasons to think that atheism is true, and that there are good reasons to think that theism is true. Now, I asked Dr. Flew to give us uh, good arguments to show that God does not exist. As I listened to the first speech, I basically distilled three arguments uh, that he offered. Number one is that if God is omnipotent, then why don't things turn out as God wills? It seems to me that the answer to that question is evident, namely, uh, God's omnipotence does not mean that he can do things that are logically impossible but it is logically impossible to make someone freely do something. Libertarian freedom entails freedom from causal restraints. And therefore, if we are truly free and God has willed to create free creatures, then he cannot guarantee how free creatures will choose. In other words, uh, Dr. Flew's fallacy is thinking that because there are logically possible worlds in which everyone always does what God wants, that those worlds are feasible for God to create. But it may well be the case that any time God would try to create such a logically possible world, the creatures would freely go wrong and would not do what God wants. And even an omnipotent being cannot make someone freely do something. So I think the first argument is simply fallacious. Secondly, he argued that the doctrine of God's love and justice is incompatible with the doctrine of hell, particularly because the punishment is not proportionate to the crime. Well, let me say two things about that. First of all, this isn't the topic of the debate this evening. The subject of the debate is the existence of God. What this argument would show is that the doctrine of hell is false, not that God does not exist. But in fact, as a Christian theist who believes in the doctrine uh, of hell, let me do, say something in defense of it anyway. Uh, number one, this is related to the problem that we just mentioned a moment ago. Namely, people freely separate themselves from God forever. It isn't that God sends people to hell. Rather, it's that people freely reject God's grace and forgiveness, and so they separate themselves from God forever. Uh, if eternal punishment were for finite sins in this life, then I agree it would be disproportionate. But the biblical view is that people of their own free will reject God and his forgiveness, and so they separate themselves from God forever. Second point I'd like to make is, if a person committed an infinite number of sins, then he would deserve eternal punishment. Now, no one obviously commits an infinite number of sins in this life, but what about in the afterlife? Insofar as the uh, damned in hell continue to hate and reject God, they continue to sin, and thus they incur further punishment. And thus, in a real sense, hell is self-perpetuating, uh, self rather, because the sinning goes on forever, the punishment goes on forever. 
Thirdly, I want to suggest that there may be, in fact, a sin of infinite gravity and proportion, which does merit eternal punishment. And this would be the sin of irrevocably rejecting God and his forgiveness. It seems to me that for the creature to spit in the face of God, his creator, to reject God irrevocably is a sin of infinite proportion uh, and could well merit uh, eternal punishment. So even though this isn't the topic of the debate tonight, I think that uh, no arguments have been given to show that the doctrine of hell is incompatible with God's love and justice. The biblical view is that God wants every single person to know him and his love and his salvation forever. And the only reason that will isn't fulfilled is because of human freedom. Now, the, the third argument that uh, Dr. Uh, if we intersperse on either side applause throughout the midst of the debate, we will extend the debate to excessive time. Please, if you would, reserve applause for the breaks between the sections of the debate. Thank you. The third argument offered by Dr. Flew was that the notion of a bodyless person is impossible. But I have two responses to this. In the first place, notice that he gave no proof of this. He gave no argument. He just asserted it's impossible. I want to see a proof of that. Secondly, I would argue that we are acquainted with our own selves as immaterial persons. You see, reductive materialism, which says that the mind is the same as the brain, just doesn't work because mental properties are clearly distinct from physical properties. For example, the brain is not sad, but a person is sad. A mental property is different than a physical property. A thought doesn't have a weight or a spatial location. So reductive materialism just won't work. What about another view called epiphenomenalism, the idea that the physical brain has mental properties which supervene on it? Well, this is simply incompatible with such things as self-identity over time or intentional states where one intends to do something because on this view, mental states are just sort of an excrescent uh, of the brain, not really a self which intends to do anything. It's incompatible with free will because there's no way these mental epiphenomenal states can freely choose anything or do anything to affect the brain. So that view seems to me to be implausible. I think the best view is some sort of dualism interactionism, that we act as agents to cause physical events in the world. Uh, we ourselves are immaterial selves uh, embodied, and God would be an immaterial self or mind which is not embodied. And so far from being implausible, I think that this is the most plausible view of human beings, and it applies to God as well. So basically, I don't think any of these reasons for atheism that we've seen tonight are very compelling. I, I don't find them persuasive. Now, what about my arguments for the existence of God? Are they any better? Well, first I argued that the origin of the universe points to the existence of God and gave a deductive argument. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. The universe has a cause. Now, Dr. Flew, in response, said, but we must explain things in terms of other things which are simply brute facts. But what my argument is, is that because the universe began to exist, it cannot be plausibly our stopping point as that brute fact. Why is that? Well, because of that first premise, that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Dr. Flew has to refute that first premise if he thinks that the universe is going to be the brute fact and the start stopping point. That first premise, I think, has two lines of support behind it. First would be the metaphysical intuition that something cannot come out of nothing. Out of nothing, nothing comes. And that's why if the universe began to exist, it cries out for a cause. Secondly, that causal premise is constantly confirmed in our experience. Nobody believes that, say, a raging Bengal tiger or an Eskimo village could suddenly pop into existence out of nothing right here in the field house. So it seems to me that that uh, first premise is very plausible and that therefore if the universe began to exist it must have a cause. Now Dr. Flew admits the universe began to exist. In his book Atheistic Humanism he says we now have excellent natural scientific reasons for believing that the universe did in fact have an explosive beginning. 
And therefore, it follows logically and inescapably that the universe has a cause. Now, he asks, does the universe, or the cause of the universe, have the attributes of God? Uh, and he suggests that it doesn't. Let me make two responses. I am using the definition of God that was used in the original Copleston-Russell debate. In that debate, Copleston proposed, by God, I quote, we mean a supreme personal being distinct from the world and the creator of the world. And Russell responded, I accept this definition. On that definition, I have given evidence for the existence of God. Secondly, remember I'm offering a cumulative case. The first argument gives us an immaterial, timeless, changeless, spaceless, beginningless, uncaused personal creator of the universe. The second argument gives us an intelligent designer of the universe. The third argument gives us a source of moral value and all goodness. The fourth argument gives us uh, a God who is active in history in the person of Jesus. And the last one gives us a God who can be immediately known and experienced. And I think the cumulative force of these arguments does indeed give us many of the attributes of God. My second argument was based on the complex order of the universe. And here I argued that the fine tuning of the initial conditions is due to either law, chance, or design. It's not due to law or chance because these are initial conditions and they cannot be explained by scientific law. Paul Davies, in his book, The Mind of God, says there is absolutely no uh, evidence in favor of these conditions being necessary. He says, even if the laws of physics were unique, it doesn't follow that the physical universe itself is unique. The laws must be augmented by cosmic initial conditions. There is nothing in present ideas about laws of initial conditions remotely to suggest that their consistency with the laws of physics would imply uniqueness. Far from it. It seems then that the physical universe does not have to be the way it is. It could have been otherwise. And I showed that, in fact, the universe is balancing on a razor's edge that cries out for some sort of explanation. It can't be from law. It can't be from chance, because the chances of this occurring are simply incomprehensible. And therefore, the best explanation is design. Now, Dr. Flew says, but we don't infer design because of complexity. We infer design because something is an artifact. But of course, the question is, how do we recognize something as an artifact? Well, we do so by recognizing a specified improbability about that. For example, two archaeologists digging in the ground, finding certain rocks shaped like uh, arrowheads or other implements, don't say, oh, look how the processes of sedimentation and metamorphosis have created these uncanny rocks. They immediately recognize the presence of design because of the improbability of that specified complexity. Or think of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. If we were to receive from outer space a message of the first 100 prime numbers in sequence, we would instantly recognize that as the product of intelligent design, just like in the Contact uh, movie. Uh, so that these specified probabilities are the way we detect design all the time in ordinary life and experience. And those very present, uh, those very uh, uh, specified probabilities are present in the Big Bang itself. And thus, in the absence of an explanation by law or chance, it seems to me that the best explanation is design. I also gave an argument based on objective moral values. Remember, I showed that in the absence of God, everything becomes socioculturally relative. Uh, everything is relative. There is no absolute right and wrong unless you have a transcendent vantage point to transcend sociocultural relativism. Dr. Flew made no response to this argument at all. Uh, I also argued that the facts of the empty tomb, the appearances of Jesus, and the origin of the disciples' faith are best explained by the hypothesis of the resurrection of Jesus. I await any alternative naturalistic hypothesis which is more plausible than that. And finally, my immediate experience of God allows me to know to, that he exists. In the absence of good arguments for atheism, I see no reason to deny my immediate experience of God and my belief that he exists. The selection of these things. Immediate experience. Uh, we need a distinction between two senses of that word experience. There's the philosopher's sense 
in which um, things like dreams, visions, hallucinations, and the philosophers say sense data are experiences. And there's experience of things where a person who's had experience of things has actually had dealings with them. Now, it seems to me that for people to ex uh, uh, say that they've had experience of either the Christian God or of Shiva the destroyer or of any other God. Um, well, it's as um, uh, Thomas Hobbes said, if someone tells me that God spake to them in a dream, why should I not say that they dreamed that God spake to them? I have no doubt at all that Dr. Craig's experience um, appears to him to be that, but um, uh, this is a matter in which the uh, subject's uh, uh, testimony is uh, not authoritative. Of course it's authoritative if we're asking uh, whether they had the experience in the philosopher's sense. The honest testimony is the last word. But when someone says they had an ex experience of dealing with cows and so on, um, uh, that means they've actually had dealings with real cows. Well, uh, so much for uh, the appeal to religious experience. I was deeply unimpressed by my friend John Hicks, his book about experience of God, in which he never confronted this obvious difficulty. Anyway, uh, then whatever begins to exist has a cause. Yes, absolutely. This is not a truth of logic, however. Uh, this, like the uh, principle that every event has a cause, is um, an experienced truth within the universe. And it is wholly arbitrary and prejudicial to think, oh, well, um, uh, uh, clearly the, universe, the whole universe must have had a cause, um, uh, so we now look for it. Then um, uh, persons. Uh, why do I have difficulty with the idea of an incorporeal person? Well, um, if I was asked to explain the meaning of wo the word person to uh, someone who didn't, I'd point around the place here. Uh, and if someone said a person has called at the house, um, uh, they would think that someone had called. Uh, the second thing I would say about this is that uh, no one, well, maybe some of my Australian friends have said that the uh, brain has experiences. I think the conscious experiences are experiences of a material thing, namely a person or material object, I should say, because a material object. They are experiences of a human being, or in some cases of animals. And then about uh, uh, this, um, uh, the tortures of the damned being self-incurred, so that's all right. Well, would in any ordinary court that was confronted by a defendant who uh, 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 pleaded guilty and... Uh, 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 um, who... Uh, Uh, yes. Well, I wish I was shouting. Um, uh, well, uh, yes. Uh, 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 yes. Self-incurred. Well, it seems to me that anyone who with his open eyes refused to do what an omnipotent being said, um, knowing that he was going to be tortured just not for a few days, like Saddam Hussein, the earthly Saddam Hussein's victims were, but forever, it would be prima facie evidence. And every American di divorce lawyer would be in there pitching again to say that the balance of the man's mind is deserved and uh, he couldn't have uh, formulated do the Americans use the phrase mens rea. So back to the um, uh, point uh, Dr. Craig thought that I was saying well uh, it's a quote from him on another occasion but so long as people are free there's simply no guarantee that everyone in that world would be freely saved. Sure, God could force everyone to repent and be saved by overpowering their wills, 
but that would be a sort of divine rape, not their being freely saved. It is logically impossible to make someone do something freely. Yes, of course there is, but I didn't say that God should coerce people, force them to do it. I said that God, the omnipotent God uh, could uh, uh, be able to make people such that they would freely choose. Now, you may say, this is the doctrine of predestination. And of course, only Calvinists believe that. Not true. Uh, this uh, view uh, that it made perfectly good sense to say, uh, and indeed it was the truth to say, uh, that uh, God guided uh, the wills both of the saved and the damned is found in, for instance, Aquinas. A quote, I've got a lot of quotations here, but still we'll stick with one. God alone can move the will as an agent without doing violence to it. Some people, not understanding how God can cause a movement of our will in us without prejudicing the freedom of the will, have tried to explain authoritative texts wrongly. That is, they would say that God works in us and to wish and to accomplish means that he causes in us the power of willing, but not in such a way that he makes us will this or that. These people are, of course, of course, look you, opposed quite plainly by authoritative texts of holy writ. For it says in Isaiah, quote, Lord, you have worked all our work in us. Hence, we received from God not only the power of willing, but its employment also. Calvin, of course, and Luther, too, maintained substantially the same position. But, to his great credit, we need to take special note of Luther's insistence that this total divine control abolishes none of the familiar humanly crucial differences. Thus, in his De Servo Arbitrio concerning the enslaved will, he wrote, quote, I did not say of compulsion, a man without the Spirit of God does not do evil against his will under pressure, as though he were taken by the scruff of his neck and dragged into it, like a thief or a footpad being dragged off against his will to punishment. But he does it spontaneously and voluntarily. Right? But again, to his credit, and unlike Aquinas, the reformer was appalled by the so pellucidly perceived implications and his response was, the highest degree of faith is to believe he is just, though his own will makes us proper subjects for damnation, and seems, in the words of Erasmus, to delight in the torments of poor wretches, and to be a fitter object for hate than for love. If I could by any means understand how this same God can yet be merciful and just, there would be no need for faith. So, uh, Luther addressed himself to the question, why then does he not alter these evil wills in which he moves? He addresses himself to precisely the question that I was raising. Understandably, if uh, unsatisfactory, the person Erasmus who raised the question simply gets the answer. It is not for us to inquire into these mysteries, but to adore them. If flesh and blood take offense here and grumble, well, let them grumble. They will achieve nothing. Grumbling will not change God. And however many of the ungodly stumble and depart, the elect will remain. Had we pressed Luther further, he would undoubtedly have referred to a key passage from his favorite epistle, the epistle to the Romans. Therefore hath he mercy upon whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, 
endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of glory which he had before prevailing. Well, I think that will be a useful thing to have on the record in this discussion, lest we have any more of this suggestion that an omnipotent being uh, could not. There's a logical inconsistency. It's an absurd idea uh, that uh, he, he could produce people to do exactly what he wanted to do. Because here you have biblical authority, the authority of three of the great doctors of the church, uh, Luther, Aquinas, and Calvin. Well, that's good enough to be going on with, I think. Um, yes. Um, I think that's enough for one. Let me be a little brief for a change in one of these things. I think that's something to think about. Let's review those three reasons that Dr. Flew offers for thinking that God does not exist. The first argument is that if God is omnipotent, then he should be able to make creatures such that they would always freely choose the way that he would like them to choose. And as Dr. Flew's last speech made very clear, he's presupposing here uh, a Thomistic, Calvinistic doctrine of divine conservation and concurrence. Now bear with me, because this is a very subtle theological point. I do not agree with Thomas Aquinas on this issue. I agree with a Molinist doctrine of divine concurrence and conservation. This is a doctrine laid out by Luis Molina, who was a uh, 16th century Jesuit reformer. Uh, Molina's view of concurrence differed from Aquinas's in the following way. Aquinas thought that God moved the will of persons to do certain effects so that God would move my will to will to say lift my arm. And I agree, if that's the way you think of God's working, then Dr. Flew is right. Omnipotence could bring it about that everyone would freely do what God wants them to do. But on Molina's view, God's concurrence acts to produce the secondary effect with my will, but he does not move on my will to produce the effect because Molina argued that would be incompatible with human freedom. Then, in fact, I would have no ability to do otherwise if it's God who is moving me to that effect. Let me quote from the introduction to Molina's treatise on divine foreknowledge by Alfred Fredoso. He writes, Debates in 16th century theology over the nature of freedom came to a focus on God's general concurrence. Molina's conception of freedom is strongly indeterministic. In modern terms, he is an unremitting libertarian. Molina insists that God's general concurrence is an action of God directly on the effect and not on the secondary agents themselves, whereas his opponents, that is, the followers of Thomas Aquinas, take it to be a divine action directly on the secondary agents, pre-moving them and through them to the effect. Molina thus denies that secondary causes must be moved by God to exercise their causal power. In this way, he stresses their autonomy. This has an immediate and profound impact on the analysis of free choice and of causal indeterminism in general. In other words, if you have a Molinist doctrine, such as I have, then it is in fact impossible for God to create a world of genuinely libertarian free creatures which always do the right thing. What Dr. Flew is in the paradoxical position of is finding himself having to prove to us that Thomas Aquinas's doctrine of divine concurrence is true if God exists. And I can't imagine how he's going to do that or even that he would want to do that. But it seems to me that Molinism provides the right analysis of freedom and concurrence and shows that even an omnipotent being cannot guarantee that free creatures will always do what he wants. And that answers immediately the second objection about hell, because God cannot freely make people believe in him and go to heaven. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, 
but that all should reach repentance. It says his desire is that all persons should be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Those are direct quotations. The only reason universal salvation is not true is because of human free will. What about the third argument concerning the possibility of a bodiless person? Well, here I didn't really understand Dr. Flew's argument. He just simply said he takes our mental experiences to be the experiences of a material object. But he didn't answer my objections to epiphenomenalism. On that view, you cannot explain self-identity over time. You cannot explain intentionality. You cannot explain free will. Uh, none of that makes sense, so I think that's an inadequate view. In any case, he's never shown that there cannot be a, an unembodied personal mind. And uh, therefore, I don't think he's shown that God cannot exist. So none of these arguments are very powerful against God's existence. Do we have reasons to think that God exists? Number one, the argument based on the origin of the universe. He grants the second premise that the universe began to exist. Therefore, the whole thing hinges on that first premise. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. And here Dr. Flew says, yes, absolutely. But, he says, this only operates within the universe. Well, I'd like to know why without begging the question, he refuses to apply this to the universe as a whole. As I said, this is based on the metaphysical intuition that something can't come out of nothing. Does Dr. Flew really believe tonight, is this his alternative to theism, that the universe just popped into existence uncaused out of nothing? I find that incredible. And we see, as I say all the time in our experience, that this doesn't happen. Why shouldn't you suddenly dismiss that experience like a cab when you get to the universe and refuse to ask for the cause of the universe? So given the plausibility of that premise, and look, I think it's clear it's more plausible than its negation, the conclusion follows that, therefore, a personal creator of the universe exists. Now, the rest of the arguments uh, have still not been refuted. The argument from complex order in the universe was not addressed. The argument from objective moral values is one of the most important, and that hasn't been addressed. J.P. Moreland, who is a Christian philosopher, underlines this point. He states, on an evolutionary secular scenario, human beings are nothing special. The universe came from a big bang. It evolved to us through a blind process of chance and necessity. There is nothing intrinsically valuable about human beings in terms of having moral, non-natural properties. The view that being human is special is guilty of speciesism, an unjustifiable bias toward one's own species. On the atheistic view, human beings are just animals, and animals don't have morality. When a lion kills a zebra, he doesn't murder it, he doesn't do anything evil, and that's all we are on the atheistic view. But I think it's evident that this is a patently inadequate view of ethics. Some things are really wrong. Other things are really good. And uh, if you agree with me about that, then you should agree that God exists as a transcendent anchor for those values. Finally, let me just say one thing about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Dr. Flew had a debate a couple of years ago with someone on this, and it was published as the book, Did Jesus Rise from the Dead? In that, my doctoral father, Wolfhard Pollenberg, wrote a response to this debate, and this is what he said. He said, Flew argues that there is simply not enough evidence to tell what really happened, but one expects that he should at least take notice of the evidence at hand and that he should do so in detail, as well as by informing himself on the scholarly discussion of it. Otherwise, the skeptical claim that the evidence is insufficient smacks of the kind of a priori rejection that Flew disdains. The weakness of Flew's argument in terms of historical detail damages his position because he admits that no a priori decision of the issue is acceptable. And again, in tonight's debate, he's refused to engage on the details of this, the historical evidence here. As for the immediate experience of God, I admit the question is, is my experience of God veridical? But what I want to know is, in the absence of good arguments for atheism, why deny my experience? God is real to me just as the external real world is real. In the absence of good reasons to deny that experience, why am I not rational to go on believing in God? <clears throat> About some <clears throat> human beings being merely animals, it is a fallacious form of argument to say that 
anything is merely this and nothing else. Of course human beings are members of the animal kingdom, but that doesn't mean they don't have special characteristics and characteristics of enormous importance and so on. So it's ridiculous to say that anyone who doesn't believe in God uh, believes or should believe that uh, human beings are merely bags of bone and something like that. For a start, there's an enormous importance between uh, what's in a body bag and a living human being. It's the extra difference between life and death. You know, it's a dead body is not merely a body, it's a dead human body, it was something that was else before. It simply does not follow that uh, because human beings are animals, they're merely animals and so they've no importance and you shouldn't think of their importance. You know, um, this just won't do at all. About the resurrection. Yes, I did say there was in, insufficient evidence to come to the desired positive conclusion. For heaven's sake, um, uh, the evidence um, uh, 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 of this, so I, perhaps I should have said something else. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 for, um, uh, we're confronted with this sort of evidence. Uh, the uh, most recent documentation after the alleged events was 30 or so years afterwards. When I was... Uh, an active member of the Society for Psychological Research, uh, we would have had grave doubts about uh, taking as a, an absolutely faithful record documents that were, say, a year or so later than the actual event. And what have we got by way of evidence? You know, again, if an omnipotent being was wanting to establish that it had become incarnate in a way that uh, he would be uh, uh, sure that the maximum number of people would come to believe in this and accept uh, what he uh, wanted them to believe, um, uh, wouldn't he have done this in um, a place where there were public records and so on? All whatever records the Romans had left in Jerusalem were destroyed after the suppression of the Jewish rising in 70 AD and so on. So my reason for saying there was insufficient evidence was simply that there was insufficient evidence. And my failure to accept the conclusion that the resurrection happened on the basis of historical evidence is simply the evidence is insufficient. After all, my whole argument is that the evidence for a desired conclusion is insufficient in this other case. Do you expect me uh, to say, oh, but I'm perfectly prepared to say, indeed I ought to say that if there's any evidence at all, uh, it doesn't have to be sufficient, I ought to re reach the conclusion. You know, I, I didn't want to refer to the resurrection and so on because it seemed to me uh, that uh, uh, this claim is uh, without anything remotely like sufficient evidence. I mean, it's an enormous puzzle to discover what uh, did happen at that time, but when you consider uh, the basis of what you've got and how the uh, 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 first... Um, uh, First New Testament documents were Pauline epistles rather than the Gospels. And what is so remarkable about the Pauline epistles is what they don't say about the detail of Jesus and uh, how the appearances uh, recorded were apparently visions which is a very different thing uh, from, uh, you know, a body into the wounds of which you can poke your fingers and that sort of thing. Anyway, um, uh, yes. Um, about uh, uh, morality, I was fiddling around and uh, finding difficulty in controlling my papers here, so I can't actually give you the Hume quotation I wanted to give. But of course, of course, I don't accept 
the sort of relativism uh, which um, most people call uh, so, yes, the, the sort of subjectivism which most people call relativism. The idea that there's no, really no right and wrong, it's a matter of, well, what's right for him is wrong for you. Um, for years I've been used to uh, having astonished students come up to me uh, and thinking I was a you know, progressive sort of chap, and why they thought that, um, and uh, being astounded to hear that I thought this was simply false. Well, I think it's false because um, the moral words simply do not mean this. Uh, as Hume was putting it in one of his less quoted passages, which I can't now quote verbatim, when people say uh, that a man is just or unjust, uh, that what he's done is right or, or wrong, they simply do not mean uh, that they like this or they dislike this or anything of that sort. Um, uh, they are, as Hume put it, appealing to some standards common to all mankind and saying, no, this is not a matter of uh, my dislikes and likes or my interests, it's a matter of something else. Um, and I, I think the... Uh, I, I'm perfectly to be, be prepared, happy to believe, and constantly maintaining things that things are really wrong, and so on. But I don't think uh, they're wrong and only wrong and only really wrong because God said so. And I certainly don't think that you can argue from your belief, which I hope many of you share with me, uh, uh, that there's a real difference between right and wrong, between justice and injustice. Uh, oh, well, this could only be so if uh, 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 God believes it. And therefore, uh, this is ev evidence for the belief in God. I think on, uh, it, it is that not at all. You can only take it that uh, this is, um, well, um, uh, that uh, the, these things are approved by God if you know that they were approved by God. Again, if you're working from within the universe, you've got to find some other account for the emission um, um, <coughs> evolution of norms and of course um, in the times of Hume and Adam Smith and Adam Ferguson and the other founding fathers of social science the first work was being done on trying to provide an account of the evolution of norms. In my closing statement, I'd like to draw together the threads in this debate and try to come to some conclusions. You remember I said that the decision as to whether or not God exists will be a matter of weighing the reasons to think that God exists against the reasons to think that God does not exist. Now, have we seen compelling reasons in tonight's debate to think that God does not exist? Well, it seems to me not. Most of these arguments that Dr. Flew gave were based on the incompatibility of omnipotence with God's not getting his way in the world, but he never refuted my explication of the Molinist doctrine of conservation and concurrence, which explained why there may be worlds that are not feasible for God because he cannot guarantee how free creatures will choose. With respect to God's being incorporeal, I explained that we have an acquaintance of ourselves as immaterial agents, and this gives us a good explanation of things like intentionality, freedom of the will, and so forth, and that there's no reason to think God can't be an unembodied mind, and little response has been made to those arguments. So I think there's negligible, if any, weight to the arguments for atheism tonight. Now, what about the five reasons I gave to think that God does exist? First, I argued that God provides, a, a or that there is a deductive argument for God as the explanation of the origin of the universe. First of all, we saw that the universe began to exist and that whatever begins to exist has a cause. And the whole debate is really hinged upon whether that causal premise is more plausibly true than not. And it seems to me clearly that it is. 
Kai Nielsen, who is an atheist philosopher at the University of Calgary, would agree with me on that score. Nielsen says this, suppose you suddenly hear a loud bang, and you ask me, what made that bang? And I reply, nothing. It just happened. Nielsen says, you would not accept that. In fact, you would find my reply quite unintelligible. Well, now, what is true of the little bang is also true of the big bang. It also must have had a cause. Something cannot come out of nothing, and therefore there must exist a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, and personal creator of the universe. The second argument, based on the fine-tuning of the universe, has gone completely unrefuted in tonight's debate. My third argument from objective moral values finally elicited a response in the last speech. It said, Dr. Flew said it's fallacious to think that if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist because human beings are not merely animals. There's a difference between life and death. But I fail to see why that's important. There's a difference between live zebras and dead zebras. But a lion doesn't do anything wrong when it kills a zebra. Richard Taylor, an eminent ethicist, asked us to imagine a race of people living without customs or laws. And he says, suppose one person kills another one and takes his goods. He says, such actions, though injurious to their victims, are no more unjust or immoral than they would be if one animal did it to another. A hawk that seizes a fish from the sea kills it, but does not murder it. And another hawk that seizes the fish from the talons of the first takes it, but does not steal it, for none of these things is forbidden. And the same considerations apply to the people he is considering. So Dr. Flew admits there are objective moral values, and I say that's great. But his worldview lacks any foundation for why human beings have objective worth and inherent dignity. I offer you a foundation in a transubjective, objective foundation in God. What about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? Again, Dr. Flew did exactly what Professor Pollenberg accused him of doing. He simply says the evidence is insufficient, but he doesn't engage himself with the evidence. Remember, I pointed out that critical New Testament historians agree that the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' faith are all established historical facts. So I'm asking Dr. Flew, what is a better explanation of those than the fact that these men were telling the truth? that Jesus did rise from the dead. Is he going to defend that uh, it was a conspiracy? Is he going to say Jesus wasn't really dead? I mean, what is his alternative? It seems to me that there is no plausible naturalistic alternative to that. Finally, let me just say a word about immediate experience of God. I myself wasn't raised in a Christian home or church-going family, but when I became a teenager, I began to ask the big questions in life. Why am I here? Where am I going? And as I read the New Testament for the first time, I was arrested by the person of Jesus. His words had the ring of truth about them, and there was an authenticity about his character that I couldn't deny. I finally, after a six-month period of intense soul-searching, just came to the end of my rope and cried out to God. And I experienced the sort of spiritual rebirth. It was though someone turned on the light inside, and God became an immediate reality to me, a reality that I've walked with day by day for the last 30 years. If you're searching for God in this way, I want to encourage you to do the same thing I did. Pick up the New Testament and read it and ask yourself, could this really be true? It could change your life in the same way that it changed mine. Well, that someone could believe the evidence for an empty tomb was sufficient. Uh, evidence... Um, recorded years after the event by we know not whom and so on. Uh, oh no, hopeless. Uh, then Kaya Nielsen, uh, having trouble with some of my old acquaintance here, uh, he wants to make out that um, uh, there's no difference between the little bang and the big bang. The whole difference is that the little bang occurs within the universe. The big bang is of the universe itself. And Taylor, who is uh, uh, saying, I mean, that's another acquaintance going wrong, um, uh, uh, no difference between uh, uh, what a lion or a fish does and what a human being does. The difference is the difference between human beings and other animals. 
the fact that we are animals does not justify a direct inference. So, so we're nothing but animals. We're no special sort of animals. It doesn't justify any inferences to these manifestly false conclusions. Uh, the one thing that I feel guilty about not doing anything about is the probabilistic arguments. Well, applying probabilities uh, to out, again outside the universe makes it impossible, I think, uh, to Im apply either sort of probability theory, either the propensity theory, because we don't know anything about the propensities of the um, objects uh, considered, and we certainly can't apply a frequency theory, uh, because uh, uh, we um, uh, haven't got any other universes, you know, there may be other universes, but we haven't got them to count there. Uh, this may not be satisfactory, but it's impossible, I think, to uh, give complete satisfaction on every issue within these limits. Uh, so uh, I think the uh, least um, useless thing I can hope finally to do is to stress once again, I have not from the beginning uh, tried to uh, 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 persuade you of the non-existence of God. I said at the beginning, I mean, but think for a moment. Uh, supposing uh, uh, you were asked, supposing you'd recently visited, as I have done, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and you'd seen a statue of the Egyptian god Horus. One of the interesting things about this god uh, was that the Egyptians in its day uh, believed that every successive pharaoh was an incarnation of that god. Now, uh, uh, would you like to provide a proof of the non-existence of that uh, God, the reason you don't believe in that God is no one's ever mentioned this uh, being before. No one can produce any compelling reasons for believing there was this God. And uh, that's it. So I haven't been trying. What I have been trying to persuade you of is that we are uh, finite, limited human beings. All our knowledge, all our theories are contained within the only universe that as far as we know there is, and certainly the one. Any move we try to make to uh, uh, going on what's non, uh, going on outside is in the last degree speculative. It may be right, it may be wrong, but um, we haven't got any evidencing as opposed to believing, uh, um, sorry, as opposed to motivating uh, reason for believing that there is such a being. And again, I think I will set a good example for my non-existent successes uh, by uh, finishing a few seconds early. <laughs>